So the Bible says, see then that you walk circumspectly. So Paul says that you make sure that you see yourself in your walk in circumspectly, he says. Circumspectly. Circumspectly, the idea is, is that you have to be careful in your walk. So this is your Christian walk over here. And it's got to be done in carefulness. It's got to be done where you're aware of your surroundings. A lot of times when we do our Christian walk, we're careless. We're sloppy. And we don't, we, we don't have good self-control. Sometimes it's good. Uh, don't get me wrong. There is good goodness in having a desire and a passion for the Lord. But sometimes when a person thinks like, okay, I'm going to become a missionary to Kenya. Why? Because of the preaching and the missionary presentation. And there's got to be somebody there to give them the gospel. Well, that's noble, but a lot of times it's not done with careful thinking. Like, did you count the cost? Do you, did you count like what kind of incidents or sufferings that you're going to have to go through over there? What you have to separate from uh, concerning about the legal, the immigration stuff, etc.? Have you considered all those options? A lot of times we just go by blind passion in our Christian walk without good self-control. But Paul says you have to watch yourself that you walk circumspectly. Why? Because at verse 14, the whole idea in our Christian walk is we got to walk in the light, not in darkness. And usually people who have a good passion may think they're walking in the light, but they're actually walking in the devil's darkness because they're outside of God's will. They're outside of the direction that God wants, wants them to walk in, in their lives. Does that make sense? So make sure that you walk in carefulness. You're aware of your surroundings. Street preaching especially is one good indication where uh, the reason why I love it is that because you're self-training yourself into becoming more bold, but also learning how to take caution as well. Amen. So it's very good self-control street preaching. You learn to hold yourself back, keep your mouth shut, uh, learn how to handle authorities wisely, people that make you angry, how much more bold you should be, how much more you should cut back. Amen. So that's one of the reasons why I believe in street preaching. You don't... Uh, we don't use electronic devices because I want them to use old-fashioned voices, learn, help them to become more bold up front and learn how to self-control in their voices so that they can save up the stamina. So that's the whole idea. Anyways, returning back, the, that's the whole point at the next part of verse 15. Not as fools, but as wise. In your Christian walk, it should not be done where you are a fool, it should be wise, wisdom in your Christian walk. Honestly, when you lash out at another person, when you're witnessing to the person and the person made you mad, ask yourself this, would you honestly tell yourself that was a wise move? Sometimes it can be. Sometimes it can be when you actually uh, be more bold against the person because you have a point over there to convict them with. See, you're thinking when you're doing it. You're not just doing it, right? So sometimes it can be, but was there thinking, carefulness, wisdom before you've done it? That's the key over there. And a lot of times when you hold yourself back and then you don't lash out against the person, we could say that you've done a wise move, but also it could be not a wise move. There are twofold applications here concerning about not as fools when you walk circumspectly. One, you're just rash about it. You're careless. But another thing is circumspectly, carefully, not as fools. Another thing is you can be foolish with your carefulness. So go to the book of Philippians, for example. Go to the book of Philippians. We're going to look at the book of Philippians, chapter 4 and verse 6. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. Sometimes there's a thing that it's called foolish paranoia. I'm not sure if I spelled that right. I can't believe I'm embarrassed about this. All right. So, is that right? 
Okay, so foolish paranoia. In other words, you think you're being careful. You think you're using wisdom before you do things, but you're just co over contemplating. And you're being paranoid. Oh, what if that happens? What if that happens? Then you're thinking too much. See that? Mm -hmm. So God don't expect you to, like, when a person answers you with something, then you think 500 different thoughts before you say something else. No, the point is you think before you do something, not think 500 different thoughts. So the idea is, is that you should think, but not do foolish thinking. That's the idea. Amen. It is foolish when you are too much careful. Look at Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. Be careful for nothing. So God's saying don't be careful about any, uh, anything, because but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 through 7, it points out that you don't have to be careful because you're already doing the contemplation. What's the contemplation? You thought about what to pray to the Lord about. Another thing is that verse says when God gives you the understanding, it goes beyond all understanding, normal understanding, and it keeps your heart and mind on Christ Jesus. See, you are thinking. That verse, you're thinking. The idea is, is that you're not overthinking. You're not being too careful. You just think enough where you surrender it to the Lord and God gives you the understanding. And this understanding passes beyond all types of different understanding that you encounter. So we're not overlooking wisdom, understanding, and thinking before you do something. No. Uh, it does involve with that, but the idea is it's not foolish. It's not foolish overthinking. It's not foolish over contemplation. It's not foolish carefulness. That's the idea. So foolishness has a twofold, go back to your main text, it has a twofold application. The idea is, is that you're not just being a fool and then you walk carelessly, but also the idea is you don't have foolish when you walk circumspectly. All right, so the foolishness should not tie to walking circumspectly. So make sure that when you walk circumspectly, well, how much, Pastor? I've got to be very careful. As, not as fools, but as wise. That's the idea. Wise carefulness. That's the idea. Wisdom never uh, separates from carefulness. And your carefulness should not cross the line and violate wisdom itself. Is it wise when you sit down and bite your fingernails and you overthink and you get a headache on how to solve the issue? See, that's not uh, wisdom. That's not wise. That's foolishness. You wasted your life, your health that God has given to you. Amen. All right, let's go back to the main text. Verse 16, redeeming the time. Now, notice that redeeming the time is in the same sentence as verse 15. When you're walking circumspectly. The whole idea about your Christian walk, when you walk circumspectly, carefully, having wisdom, wisely, is that it's all about time saving. So it is not time saving when you just go day in and day out contemplating on one thing. When there are so many things you've got to be doing for the Lord. See that? And it's also not time saving when you're being rash and careless in your Christian walk because by being rashly called, quote unquote, to the missionary as to Kenya region, you wasted what? How many years of your life? There are people's children and wives who became a wreck because of the careless, rash decisions of the husband who went out there. Sometimes the Lord, he wants you to be wise in your Christian walk. So then you wasted your time and your years. The whole idea is that you got to redeem the time. Now redeem, obviously, what does that mean? It means to buy back, pay back. Wait a minute. Why do you have to buy back time? That doesn't make sense. Why is it that you have to buy back time if you wasted it? Uh, what does that mean, Pastor? Because, look at the next part of the verse. It says, because the days are evil. 
The idea is this, the reason why you have to buy back time is that it's currently being stolen, like even right now. Didn't you know that? You might say, really, it's being stolen right now. Yeah, it's the devil. It's called the world. It's called the flesh. It wastes every second trying to please itself. As every second passes by, it's spent, be honest now, how much have you spent it on the Lord? Amen. What is it used for? Is it your flesh? Is it for the world? Do this job, do this task, do this project. And, hey, why don't you spend time with us, your worldly friends? Is it the devil? He sends a sudden attack all of a sudden. Right when, oh, the blowout's coming, I'm going to get things ready. And then the devil sends an attack, right? Right. So then he tries to steal back your time. So the idea is because the days are evil. It's an, we, we do not understand that we are living in, whether you believe it or not, the days that we are living in are evil times. This is, these are evil times that we live in that people do not understand. Because literally 24-7, all you see is the world, the devil with his minions are behind the scenes, and then all you take account and notice is yourself more than Jesus Christ, right? How your flesh feels. So these are evil times that we live under. That's why your time gets stolen every second, every minute. So that's why you have to buy back time. You don't realize it. Right now, you're wasting your seconds and your minutes. So you have to buy that back. That's why it's so important in your Christian walk. Be careful how you're literally spending every second in time. Dr. Upman mentioned one thing, which might be a little baffling for some of you, but he would mention where if some people, I don't think he said all, but some people where when they're brushing their teeth and then they're not thinking about what they're going to do throughout the rest of the day, if when they are cooking, they're not spending that time in uh, memorizing scripture, etc., you're wasting time and you're fulfilling the devil's duty. What's he talking about? Multitasking. The idea is, is that time is so precious that you're going to have to learn to be wise in your Christian walk into buying back time. You can buy back time. You lost time in Bible reading. Buy it back during that long drive after work with listening to audio Bible studies. Sometimes uh, you have to buy back time for yourself because time gets stolen from you. How long uh, have you guys wasted your Christian walk? I think that's a good example, right? How long have you already wasted your life in a backslidden years in a worldly life? Or how long was it until you finally got saved? See, all those years you have to buy back. My dad said one thing, which was a huge blessing. He mentioned this when he preached a long time ago in our church. It's a rare sermon that he did. But he mentioned that uh, this day, when he was preaching to us, he said this day... Uh, I was able to live, I don't know, one or ten more days more than I lived for the devil. What did he mean by that? Because for 30-something years, he mentioned, he lived for the devil. But then as soon as he got saved and then he got called to the ministry and then he preached at my church, he said, now I got those 30-something years back from him plus extra days. Wow. Finally, I lived more than the devil, he said. That spoke a lot of volume there. What did he mean by that? He bought back time finally. But it took him 30-something years. That's why it's best to live for God when you're young. All right? Some of you are already old, and some of you know what I'm talking about. You wasted so many years in sin and iniquity. So there's a lot you need to buy back. Because why? The days are evil. That's a sermon right there, right? So then it may motivate you more to amp up your Bible reading. Get more involved in church. Learn to multitask and do more things for the Lord. Why? Because you've already wasted all those times spent on sin. And it's about time you got to learn to like basically overrun that, right? It's, your living for God's got to be larger than how much you lived in sin. How much time have you spent on sin? That's the idea. How much time have you wasted in sin? It's about time that you redeem the time. Buy back your time. Amen. Let's go back. Wherefore be ye not unwise. So 
Paul says again, that's why you cannot be unwise. You can't be foolish. You have to be wise. Why? Because you have to buy back the time. You have to walk circumspectly, etc. Uh, the previous verses, you can't be caught up in darkness. People who are walking in darkness are foolish people, despite of how many PhD degrees they have to justify marijuana, for example, to justify homosexuality as a normal behavior, for example. See, that's foolish thinking, and that's all in dark verse 14. So Paul's saying, by context of that, you have to not be unwise like those guys. You have to be wiser than that. You have to be smarter than that. Don't be, un, uh, don't be unwise, foolish, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Go to Romans 12, Romans 12. So you have to be understanding on what God's will is in your life. Do you understand the will of God? You might say, I'm having a hard time to find and understand the will of God. You shouldn't be. You might say, well, why is it that I can't understand? Simple, it's because your mind has been too much into the world. Because your mind has been so much into the world that all you have is a worldly understanding of things. You don't have a spiritual understanding of things yet. So you have to diminish and filter out that worldly, under, uh, that worldly influence that you've been so much sucked up in. And you got to suck yourself into, immerse yourself into spiritual things, into God's world. That's why Paul mentioned the previous verse, you got to buy back your time. Why? Every time was spent on the world, the flesh, the devil. Because it was so much time spent on that, it blinded your understanding of what God's will is. So you have to buy back your time by getting into the spiritual things of God so that you can see the will of God. Amen. That's the answer of understanding God's will. In verse 2 it says, And be not conformed to this world. See that? You cannot be conformed to this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Get out of there. So you got to get that. So in other words, God is saying that your mind is right now. Right now conformed to the world. So you got to get out of there. You got to renew it. Keep reading. That ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's how you can find God's will. Is that you got to get your mind out of this gutter. And then you've got to transform it into the spiritual plane. So then how do you, I go to the spiritual plane? Well, it says the word is over there, prove, right? Prove what is a good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. That's how you find God's will. It's proven. Well, how do you prove what is God's will? Well, you know, you're not that much of a dummy, all right? I know you and I are dummies, but you're not that much of a dummy, all right? How do you prove it? It's through the Word of God. Well, I still don't know God's will when I read that Bible. Well, you're not reading enough then. How's that for a change, right? So you have to read and you have to study. You have to keep attending church Bible study. Glean the wisdoms off of God's preachers. I mean, you got to get so much where you can learn in the book. And then the book always proves the will of God, does it not? It always does. It doesn't, conf it doesn't conflict the will of God. So in order to find God's will, it needs to be proven. How do you prove it? It's through the word of God. So get as much understanding that you can get into the word of God. But you're too much into the world's point of view, right? Worldly psychology, humanism. Uh, the economy, so then you rely on the economists for the virus that's going on. You're relying on the scientists for life issues. You rely on psychologists of all things. When life issues should rely on to the word of God. So it's so amazing where our world has fallen into so much depravity. What's that? Conform to the world. And because you're conformed to the world, you cannot understand God's will. How do I understand God's will? It's got to be proven. How do I prove it? Through the word of God. Right now you know what God's will is, despite of the lack of scripture you know. Because there is some scripture in you that know what God's will is. 
well, I don't know if God wants, to, uh, wants me as a missionary in Kenya. What are you looking at? You know what God's will is for you right now. What is it, Pastor? Go to church. Well, I don't have a Bible-believing church near me, you know. Well, then you got us online. What, what are you doing skipping church? What's God's will for me? Read your Bible. What's God's will for me? Well, why don't you pray? Isn't praying God's will? He wanted you to pray. And when you pray, you can ask him, Lord, what is your will for me in my life? What are some of the things? In, uh, I don't know if God wants me to quit that job. Well, you do know some things of God's will. What is that? Is that job making you backslide? Is that job having worldly influence on your life? Is that job making you sin? See, that much you know God's will. So that helps you in beginning steps. I'm not saying quit your job, but it's helping you with beginning steps on, ah, okay, so I'm starting to see more that this is becoming more of the world rather than the will of God. And I cannot be conformed to this world. Sometimes it could be where the Lord is giving that to you as a test, where you don't let the job suck you up into backsliding, but you have to keep up with that job and complete it. Why? Because he wants to see how strong you are as a Christian to stay faithful for him. So see, all these things, the idea is you do know some things about God's will, so start doing those things. And when you start doing those things, his will becomes even more clear. And it, become, and it opens up more. And then you'll also see th some things that are not God's will apparently more and more. For example, that same job that I gave as an example, as you dig more and more into that job, you start to realize where that job starting to make you uh, suffer in your family life. So you're not being the faithful husband, the faithful father that you are to be. And it's also causing you to even sin probably. If you want to work in this job, you have to go to these uh, business part meetings and you have to drink with them so that you can make a good impression of our workplace. See, then God be makes it more clear for you. And then you start to see some things that are definitely not God's will. All right, let's return to our main text. I hope that's been helpful. Uh, verse 15 through 17 is very life-changing. I mentioned that to you last week as a heads up that the lesson was going to be life-changing. So all these things will be help, will be definitely life changing. It will benefit your life. So I hope that you did contemplate, pay attention, and took good notes about these because later on in life you're going to need them. It's going to be very helpful for you. They're all connected together, 15, 16, 17. That's how I see it as. All right. But Paul is still continuing on here. And so he's still giving a lot of good practical advice to Christians. Verse 18, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. So Paul says that you cannot be drunk with alcohol. Why? Because inside alcohol, it is, the Bible says excess. Excess, the idea is, is that it's uh, either unnecessary, overfilling, or beyond the limit. So that is very interesting. There are two things. One, Christians should not get involved with alcohol. Amen. All right, that's very apparent and plain at verse 18. You cannot get involved with alcohol. It is a sin, period. But a lot of people and some idiots who are so intellectual and pretend they're intellectual, like Jeff Durbin and all these uh, wicked evil people, Pretending that they're more uh, that they are saved. Why? Because I developed enough fruits for the Lord, but then they justify drinking. Uh, that's hypocritical. That's self-righteousness at its core. That really makes me upset. Oh, I'm more saved than these guys. Why? Oh, because I developed fruit that those person didn't. Oh, uh, aren't you drinking alcohol? Oh, yeah, but I'm still saved. I, I'm still more holy than those guys. My fruits. See, that's wickedness. I despise that. And these are the same Christians who are intellectual and they go atheist debates and they know so much apologetics, yet they lack the basic principle of the word of God, which is beyond my understanding, except that they just want to keep their sin. So people like him, their problem is, is that they justify alcohol by saying that, well, the Bible condemns drunkenness, but the Bible does not condemn drinking wine itself. You can drink wine in moderation. Now, they'll use verses to justify it, but there are verses to easily debunk that. And I've given plenty of videos on that if you look them up. 
But one of the verses to debunk that is this verse, 18. You want to use that. The Bible says, wine itself, see that? Wine itself, comma, what? Wherein is what? Excess. See, I already told you that this is, will lead you to drunkenness. Wine itself is guaranteed to make you commit that sin. All right. Go to the book of Proverbs. Go to the book of Proverbs. Chapter 20. Proverbs chapter 20. So the Bible condemns not just drunkenness like you think, but wine itself. Drinking wine itself. You might say, oh, no, it's okay as long as I don't get drunk. Well, how, how many... You think that the people who go to AA meetings, that that's their justification and excuse? No, they know. They're not stupid. They know that just drinking a little bit of that is going to, you're going to get drunk. They'll laugh at you. People at AA and uh, people who are drug addicts, they might not be intellectuals, but they sure have more wisdom than Jeff Durbin and all those intellectuals who justify drinking. Amen. Let's look at the book of Proverbs chapter 20. Verse 1. Okay, see if I'm reading this correctly. Drunkenness is a mocker. Drunkenness is raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Did I read that correctly? I didn't read that correctly. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. See that? Itself is a sin. So you know what's considered down in the gutter here? That's considered to be simple, uh, sinful. That's alcohol itself. So don't drink. Period. That's a sin. Oh, I don't get drunk and I don't beat up my kids and stuff like that. No, no, it don't matter. It's a sin. It's a sin itself. You need to repent and get that right with God. That is not condoned. That is definitely not condoned. All right, let's go back to our main text. So use verse 18 to prove that it's not just drunkenness God is condemning. God believes that wine itself is excessive. It is over drinking. It is beyond the limits. All right, let's go back. But there's a comparison here at verse 18. Don't be overfilled, right? Excessive. Drunk into the wine. Contrast that, but be filled with the Spirit. Amen. So you got to be filled with so much Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, the thing about people that they do not understand about the Holy Spirit filling is that it is compared to, like, drunkenness. You might say, why is that? Why? You can get so many good sermons out of that. You might say, no way, Pastor. Yes. Let's give, let's give some examples here. Let's give some examples here about the Holy Spirit. For example, when you look at a drunk man, when he's drinking and when he's drunk, he literally does not care what people think, and then he'll just act out the way where his liquor leads him, right? Why, there you go. Didn't you get the gleaning out of there? If you're so much filled with the Holy Spirit, guess what happens? You don't care what other people say or what they think. Amen. And you just guide and lead to where how the Holy Spirit leads you. That's the important thing about the filling of the Holy Spirit. You might say, uh, what other example can we glean out of a drunken man concerning about the filling of the Spirit? Well, the filling of the Spirit, a lot of times when they talk, you know, they just talk in a way that does not talk normally where Amen. people in the world will think, you are out of this world. Amen. You are out of your mind. You're not talking straight. You're not talking like we are. Well, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit and then you just preach where the Holy Spirit wants Amen. you to preach, the people who come to the church for the first time, they go, this is not a normal church service. You're not like a typical pastor. You don't talk like we do. And you have a weird type of thinking. And then there, one day where they're going to call your Christian belief a mental illness, which they are trying little by little. They're calling it a mental illness. But back then, homosexuality was considered a mental illness. And you see that distorted world thinking? They put the mental illness on the Christian belief and not on something that is genuinely a mental disease itself. When you're drunk, sometimes you notice that with drunk people, that they just keep drinking. They can't stop. 
I mean, no matter how many times that it just damages their family, it just uh, damages their home life or their job life, they don't care. They just have to keep drinking. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, even though your family life, uh, you have to sacrifice your family life, your job life, and how the world looks at you, you don't care. You just have to keep being filled with the Holy Spirit. See, the Christian life, they think you're crazy. You're nuts. Why can't you do this in life? You can do things better. You, why did you become a pastor of all things in the San Francisco Bay Area, Silicon Valley? You could have done better things. Well, I'm sorry, but I got a job from this being right here. And he guided me at this place. So a lot of times I just do things where I have to sacrifice. Sacrifice my own gains, my own personal benefits. Because what? That's what the Holy Spirit does when you're filled. Amen. Man, there's so much great sermons about the Holy Spirit. Uh, great example is you can, uh, one day, hopefully uh, the sermon will show, but Pastor Hilton Smith preached a great sermon, great sermon about addiction. I mean, he'll do a much better job than me. He'll do a much better job than me. One day, hopefully, you guys can find that sermon, or we could one day upload it over here. Let's go back to our main text, all right? But that's enough. So the filling of the Spirit, did you notice that then? Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? How you can tell you're filled with the Holy Spirit is you compare that with the drunken man. So then ask yourself this. So then do you do it anyways? You don't care what other people think and you do it because that's what the Holy Spirit filled you and told you to do. You got to witness to that soul. You got to read your Bible. You have to not care how the world thinks of you and take a stand for Jesus Christ. Amen. You have to go out and street preach. Who cares how people look at you? Look like You look like a nut job. Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? That's, that's how you can tell you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. You compare yourselves with examples of a drunken man. And when you look at that, then you can see how less filling of the Holy Spirit you have. Or how much you lost the filling of the Holy Spirit. Now, a great example, let's look at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Here's a great example of people being filled with the Holy Spirit. And we're going to look at verse 8. Verse 8. Acts chapter 2. And verse 8. These people were filled with the Holy Spirit, and then the world accused them as, Oh man, these guys are weird. Who are these nut jobs? And they say, They're drunk. They're drunk. <laughs> Acts chapter 2. We'll look at verse 8. And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born. So notice that they were preaching in different languages, verse 9 and 10. They weren't doing the charismatic speaking of tongues. That's not where I'm getting at. They were filled with the Holy Spirit that they were preaching in different languages to these people. So they were street preaching here. They were giving the gospel. They didn't care what other people thought of them. So then look at verse 12. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Verse 13, others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. All right, go back to Ephesians chapter 5. That's a great example. That's a great example. That means they were filled with the Holy Spirit because they contrast, uh, they compared them to drunken people. If you compare yourself with a drunken person and then your Holy Spirit example follows the way that a drunken man would do things, then you know that you got the Holy Spirit in you. Now, obviously, I'm not saying that uh, when I'm comparing the example of a drunken man, I'm not talking about people you have to do exactly the same specific things as a drunken man all right obviously you all know that I'm not saying that the idea is is that God wants that's why God says don't be drunk with wine because he knows what wine will do but God knows that when you're filled and overfilled with the Holy Spirit he knows what you are capable of doing what you will do let's go back to Ephesians 5 verse 19 speaking to yourselves now God says that in verse 19, it's continuing the thought. So then, in other words, verse 18, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, what are you going to do? You're going to speak to yourselves. Notice three categories. Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. 
singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So there are three categories. You're going to uh, speak to yourself psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. And while you're singing and making melody, it's going to be from your heart. In your heart, you're going to do it. And that's unto the Lord. Now, I want you to take note of this. There's a horrendous movement that's becoming so popular and Hillsong is leading the way on that one, but I wouldn't be surprised there's going to be a new movement that will come out because it's overtly popular. That's the contemporary Christian music. Contemporary Christian music, you'd be su surprised how many people are struggling with the addiction of drunkenness, but this one itself is worse, the music. The music is a drug addiction. And then a lot of people justify the music that they sing. Why? Oh, because I'm singing it to the Lord. As long as I sing it to the Lord, then it's fine. No, there's a key difference with contemporary Christian music. It is known as contemporary music. Notice right here, it's not psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Those, these three are the categories where you find the right Christian music. Well, then what is that? Well, you, I mean, you got a dictionary. You can look it up yourself. So a psalm is, if you look up the word psalm in your dictionary, and then you pay attention to the music that we sing at church at Sundays, you hear these three in our church. Psalms, these are a more sacred type of worship music. That's what psalms are. You'll notice that when we start out, a lot of times we do this, all right, unless uh, maybe the song leader does things differently. But a lot of times when we start out, our music for the day, it's more of a, you notice the feeling too, the music is more somber, right? It's more sacred. It's like a worship style music. You'll notice in the genre too of the hymn books, they'll say worship, worship. So that's what psalms are. It's more, uh, you'll notice that psalms is something that's from the scriptures too, one of the books of our Bible. You'll notice that these types of music, that the wording is more old, uh, it's more archaic, right? It's more sacred. It's, um, it's more deep thinking, contemplating. So that's what psalms are. Hymns, that's the next category. Why, that's pretty obvious what the hymns are. The hymns is the majority of what we uh, sing on Sundays, right? So what we sing on Sundays, most majority of the time, are hymns. Hopefully California can start opening up again real soon, and then we can start singing hymns indoors one day. Maybe the Lord will open uh, that up in public. One day we could do that in public one day. But aside from that, when we get back to our point, hymns are the type of songs that you hear majority of the time on typical Sundays. Spiritual songs. So then these are things where this is what contemporary musicians are going to pull up on you. So you need to know this argument. Contemporary Christian music, what they're going to argue is this. Well, people accused Fanny Crosby, they accused Martin Luther, that the song they sang was contemporary in their day. Now, is that true? That is actually true, but it's not the way that you think it. So CCM, they will say, the reason why our music is justified is because it's contemporary in our time. The reason why people had trouble with Luther's music and Crosby's music, which is true, the same kind of logic that contemporary Christian music does today is it's deviating from the typical type of music that uh, the church is used to sing. They feel like it's uh, more out of bounds. It feels more fleshly. It feels better. It's more playful, etc. It has more of a beat, so to speak. So, which is basically true, it is true that Luther's time, and then, yeah, even Charles Wesley, Crosby, that they would use music that's contemporary in their time, just like contemporary Christian music, that they will take music contemporary in their time. But there's a key difference. They already gave away the answer. Contemporary in their time, and it's called music. See, they deceive you with Christian, see? Forget that, all right? Contemporary music. That's the key. We're not talking about lyrics here, words. We're talking about music. That's one, music. 
Another thing is contemporary in their time, the music. Let me tell you something, all right? There were worldly songs during Wesley and Crosby and Luther's time, and they would sing those at the bars. But if you drop the words and just listen to the music itself, the music itself, there's nothing wrong with majority, if not all of the music that time. Music itself. I mean, you got to realize that classical music itself, that it's not Christian wording, but a lot of churches will mention that we got to do like classical music type of style, etc. Why? Because, see, we're not talking about the words here. The music is key. Music is key. But the music contemporary in our time today, now come on, be honest, all right? Be honest. The music contemporary in our time, can you justify that? Look at, uh, look at Justin Bieber, Ariana Grande, look at uh, Lady Gaga, etc. Why do they dress up the way that they dress? Why do they live their lifestyles in a way that way? You know why? Because it all revolves around music and they know it. Music is their life itself. Usually you can notice a person's behavior from their music too sometimes. Because this is the way that they sing that's the way they live. So then they dress that way. They talk that way. They act that way. Great example is rap music. Why do people get into rap music? Because of that lifestyle that's heavier, more violent, more sexual. That's why they love the rap music. Music dictates what you are. And that is a matter of fact statement. If you're, if you're an honest musician, which musicians, I know even contemporary Christian musicians will have to agree with, and psychologists and secular music musicians itself and historians. That's a matter of fact. So the music contemporary in our time, that's not justified. That is definitely not justified itself. Because the beat of the contemporary music of our time is severely at a pattern of upbeat, which I'm not going to get into. But the point is, the point is, just look at the music in our time. Look at the musicians themselves who use that music. Look at the contemporary, th look, this is so obvious with famous contemporary Christian musicians, they'll mention who their role models are in the music industry. And you know what they're going to pull up? It's not Charles Wesley. No. It's not Fanny Crosby. And they will mention these pagan, wicked, lost, hellbound rock musicians. You know why? Because they know it's impossible to separate music from the lifestyle. <clears throat> so then... That's where spiritual songs come in. The idea is, it's okay to take music contemporary in our time. There's nothing wrong with that. But the idea is, you have to look at the music itself in our time, which one is clean and which one is unclean. That's the idea. So there is music contemporary in our time uh, that we can use that is clean. And uh, I don't know, because so, much, so many people are into uh, the rock music, the rap music. You can take, like what Charles Wesley did, you can take music contemporary in our time and then use it for spiritual music. For example, for children's music, what do they sing? Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Well, if you replace that with Christian wording, there's nothing wrong with that. But then you take uh, music from Lady Gaga and then you replace that with Christian music. That ain't godly. Taylor Swift music, that ain't godly, man. So uh, people, they try to justify their contemporary Christian music by saying, well, during that time, it was considered contemporary. So what is contemporary? I'm not going to sing a music. Some Christians, they're, they're taking this very seriously about contemporary Christian music, that they say, I'm not going to use a song or a music until 10 years later, when it's not contemporary in my time. No, no, there's nothing wrong with that. That's where spiritual songs come in. Is it spiritual? That's the idea. Contemporary Christian music, we know this. That ain't spiritual. That's fleshly. It's apparent. It's so apparent. It's fleshly. And if it's not fleshly, it's spiritual, then use it. Then use it. Uh, gospel music is one great example, but there are some gospel music that now is uh, contemporary Christian music that you have to be careful for, about. Uh, the King is Coming, right? We do that. The specials you hear, 
in this place. A lot of it is music contemporary in our timetable. So these songs are considered spiritual songs. That's, this verse is a great verse that will show you what kind of songs to sing. Well, then how do I know that it's uh, contemporary uh, Christian music that's fleshly and wrong, Pastor? Well, the verse already gave it to you. It's spiritual singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. That's crucial. The key reason why we condemn contemporary Christian music, like I mentioned to you before, it's that upbeat pattern. Now, I know that maybe Crosby, Wesley, it would have more, I guess, quote-unquote, rhythm or beat, so to speak, that they might claim. But the idea is this. The idea is, can you honestly say it, has me it is truly a melo melodious song? It is melody. It's so obvious, all right? You're not stupid, man, all right? You, you cannot enjoy a good rock concert without the drums. You have to have that. Like, if there's a choice between a piano or a drum, by their fruits ye shall know them, all right? In a rock music concert, people, what do they want? Drums! That's why, because that's more about rhythm, upbeat pattern. That's not melody itself. So that's how you can tell. How you can tell it's a, not the contemporary Christian music genre that's fleshly is the key word is melody. That is key. Some songs can be more, uh, have more of a rhythm or a beat, so to speak, compared to other songs, but that's not the point. The point is, is that can you truly call it melodious or are you going to have to call it more of upbeat? That's the key. Are you going to call that, uh, man, that beat is a good beat type of song? Or can you honestly say it's more of a melodious type of song? Then you can tell. Not only that, it says it's uh, spiritual in your heart to the Lord. So then just be honest, man, all right? Think about people who go to the bars, people who go to uh, the, the places where they can dance, and then the violent sceneries in music or something that's sexual. Think about it. You think that they're going to play this kind of music at the background? Or what kind of music will they use? You know. See? You know the difference with what's fleshly and what's spiritual. Don't pretend that you don't. You do know. Because you do know whatever is fleshly to you that will please your sin. You know exactly the type of music you're going to use. And if you don't believe me, you try, you try sinning. You try drinking that bottle while playing Arise My Soul Arise. You're going to get under conviction. Try to play some of the blowout music. Uh, play some of the stuff where we're running around the room uh, because it's so much beat. No, keep on the firing line. You, that's like the, the most beat music that you can think of. But even with that type of music, I mean, can you honestly commit fornication with that type of music? You can't do that. How can you commit fornication with that type of music? But you know what to play. You know exactly what to play. The lightest type of backbeat music, jazz, all the way to the hardest beat, rap and heavy metal. Yeah. You know. Okay, that's enough about music. I'm sure you learned a lot. Now verse 20. Verse 20. Giving thanks always for all things unto God. So it's important that you always thank God for everything. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And this is a verse that should be memorized at verse 18. It's an important verse. As you're walking literally every step in your Christian life, it's got to be full of thanksgiving to, to the Father. Amen. God has to receive the glory because every step that you take is literally God's grace and mercy Amen. in all your life. All right, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. The Bible reads here at verse 18, In everything, everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So that's God's will that you thank Him for everything. Wait a minute, remember back the context of Ephesians 5? Ephesians 5 says give thanks uh, for all things, but he mentions about the will of God, doesn't he? 
See, they're all in line together. So you do know the will of God. If you want to find the will of God, one of them is to thank him for everything you go through. Go back to our main text. Bad things in life, he deserves the glory and you should thank him for that. You got to thank him for literally everything. Because the reason why you can thank him for literally everything, even the bad things, is because you deserved worse. Usually when you think about what you truly deserved, then uh, you start to be more appreciative. Here's a great example. I mean, some of you don't do this. Some of you, if a car accident happens, and then because of that you're falling behind in work, and then you come out and then you start to complain and you go, oh God, why did this happen? And then you whine and stuff like that. Hey man, you got to thank God for everything. Well, it's hard to do that, Pastor. No, not if you switch your thinking. What did you deserve? I think you deserve to die in that car wreck. It could have been worse, right? Three other cars could have hit you. There, do you know how many people became uh, busted their necks because of car accidents? Thank God you're alive, right? Even if your health got hurt, it's not that bad. There are, see, so then when you start thinking that way, you realize there's more things than what happens. Instead of a complaining attitude, it switches to more of a what? Thanking attitude. Thank you so much, God, for protecting me. Uh, there was a huge good testimony. Uh, I, this happened, yeah, I think it was in our church. Yeah, happened in our church where, uh, I could be wrong about this because this was many years ago, but one of the people in our church, he had a car accident, and it was a really bad, uh, serious accident. And then the news made, uh, put that in their article, but then they mentioned also that the person who was involved in that serious accident got out of the car and started jumping up and down and praising the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> That's a great testimony, man. And that person was uh, attending our church that time. That's a huge, great testimony. Why? Instead of the person coming out and then just complaining, whining and say, oh, I hurt. He just got out and said, thank you, Father, for protecting me. That's a great testimony. So thank him for everything. Keep reading. Unto God and the Father. So again, we see that uh, phrase that's usually occurs in the Bible where it will go, God and something. Savior and Lord and. Usually it does that because it's sharing the same idea of the person. God and the Father. So the Father is God. The Father is God. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice you're thanking him in Jesus Christ's name. Okay, the only way you can thank God, it's all done through a communication of prayer, right? When you thank God, you're, you are praying to him, aren't you? Because you're talking to him. So then, that's why when we can see that as prayer, because prayer usually ends in what? In Jesus' name. So in this verse over here, when you're thanking the Lord, you are doing it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. A great example is before the meal that you eat. Before the meal that you eat, what do you do? Lord, thank you so much for this food. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. This is a great example of that. A great example of thanking the Lord in Jesus' name. That's done in prayer. That's why we do that. That's why we pray that way. That's why thanks should be it included in your prayer. This verse is the proof text that you want to use to show people how to pray. Well, how should I pray to God? Well, you should thank Him. What's a verse on that? Right here, verse 20. You're doing... You're thanking God, but you're do closing it in Jesus' name. That's a prayer right there. Okay, so I hope that you learned a lot of good things today. Um, 21, 22, 23, 24, uh, and the rest is good, is a great passage about submission. And a lot of people, we live in a day and age where they cannot stand to submit, especially in these dark times, right? Where everyone is frustrated and angry. So this teaching will be helpful concerning about submitting to authority. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for the truth of your word and uh, so much life lessons that can help us improve in our way of living where it can glorify you and make us more happy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.